Hello and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to take a look at some of the common hooks used in the Dioxys framework to build reactive components. And along the way, you'll learn how to structure your components to optimize state management and avoid unnecessary re-renders. So hopefully by the end of this video, you should have a good understanding of some of Dioxys's hooks, what they're used for, when to use them and how to use them. With that said, if you enjoyed the video, please consider liking or subscribing and let's get started. The first hook that we're going to take a look at is the use signal hook. This is the most common hook and it's used to manage state and drive UI updates. So in this example, I'm going to use the use signal function to initialize an i32 value using a closure. And this function is going to return a signal of type i32 and we can store this signal into a mutatable variable which we can then use to update the value in the signal. To demonstrate how to update the value in the signal, I'm going to create a button that increments the value each time I click on the button. And I'll also add a label so that we can see that value change. Now notice how I'm using the set method on the signal. This is important because when the value in the state changes, the component is re-rendered. Now let's run the code to see what the result is. But a quick word of caution, the screen is about to get really bright and this is likely to happen throughout the video. So here we have the app component with a label and a button. And every time I click on the button, the counter state is going to increment. And when that happens, the component is going to re-render itself. So now we know we can use a signal to store state and also drive UI updates. But signals can't be passed between threads, so if you wanted to update the UI based on some process that's happening within a thread, then that's not going to be possible. Let's see what happens when we try to move the counter variable into a new thread. So as you can see, Rust does not like this code, and that's because somewhere in Deoxys' implementation it's using a ref cell to store the state data. And a ref cell doesn't implement the sync trait, so it can't be sent between threads safely. But thankfully, Deoxys provides another version of the use signal hook, and that is the use signal sync hook. And as the name suggests, signals of this type can be shared between threads safely. So in this next example, we're going to increment the counter every two seconds to simulate a background process. And now, if we run the app, we should see the counter increment every two seconds. And just like the use signal hook, the app component is being re-rendered every time the counter changes. So now that you know how to manage state in Dioxys, let's take a look at an example where state can have an effect on other components that don't need to be re-rendered when some state changes. Now if that explanation wasn't very clear, don't worry, when we take a look at some code, it'll become a lot clearer and you'll understand what I mean. So here we have an app component with two inner components, a left and a right component. And the left component contains a button that when clicked will add an item to a list within that component. And the right component will show the selected item from the list. Now let's add some code and get these components working. So the first thing that I'm going to do is create a type called user. And this type will hold some basic data for a user. So for this example, I'm going to have an ID, name, and an email field. And I'm also going to derive debug, clone, and partial EQ on this type. And now I'm going to create a state that holds a vector of type user. And so when we click on the button in the left component, we'll add some new users to this state. But first, I'm going to add a default user, and this is just to mock the process of having some initial data. Now notice I'm creating the state in the app component, but we want to create users when we click on the button in the left component. And so to do this, we're going to pass the state as an argument to the left component. And now that we have access to the user state in the left component, we can iterate over the items and show them in a list. And then later we'll add an onclick event to the list item so that we can view the details in the right component. Now in the onclick of the button, I'm going to hard code a user so that each time the button is clicked, it's going to add the same user to the list. Now there's one last thing that I want to do and that is to add a print statement to both the left and right components so that we can see when these components get rendered. And now let's compile and run the app and see what we have so far. So I've added some CSS to the app so that we can see the layout better but take a look at the terminal on the right and you'll see that the left and right components have been rendered. Now if I add a few items to the list you'll see that only the left component gets re-rendered. And this is because the right component doesn't take any state that's modified by the app component or the left component. Now when the left component gets re-rendered, all the UI elements in that component get re-rendered too. So in this case, we want to avoid the add button from being re-rendered and only update the list when an item has been added. To fix this, we need to move the button into a separate component. And this is because the button doesn't have any state that will cause it to re-render. Now in case I haven't made this clear, a component will only re-render when a state has changed and not when the value has been updated. We can even split the left component further by moving the list into a separate component of its own. And in practice, this is what you should normally do. But for now, let's keep the code as it is and test the code to make sure that the button isn't being re-rendered. But just before I compile the code, I'm going to add a print statement here so that we can verify that the component is being rendered only once. Okay, so now if I click on the add user button, only the left component should be the only component that gets re-rendered, even though the button is a sub-component of the left component. 
So knowing this, you can avoid parts of your component from being re-rendered again just by simply moving it to a new component. Now the last thing that we want to do is add an on-click event to the list item so that when we click on it, we can view the details in the right component. To do this, we're going to create a new state to hold the selected item. And this state is going to be of type user and we need to initialize it with a default value. And to do that, I'm going to derive the default trait. And now we need to pass the selected user state to the left component so that we can use it in the on-click event for the list item. But before we get to that, I'm going to move the UI for the list item into a separate component. And the reason for that is because of the on-click event handler that we're going to add to the list item. So you can see here, I'm using a closure with the move keyword for the on-click event handler. And so because of the move keyword, the closure is going to take ownership of any variables it receives resulting in lifetime issues. So to solve this, we need to clone the user instance from the for loop before we pass it to the closure. We also need to pass the selected user state to the list item so that we can set the state in the on-click event. Now this will cause an error and if we take a look at the error message, Ross is telling us that we can't move the user variable out of the closure. To fix this, we need to clone the user once again. Now this is not great because we've cloned the user twice, but it will help to fix the problem. And finally, all we have to do is pass the selected user state from the app component to the right component so that we can view the details. Now remember the right component will only re-render when the selected user state changes. And now let's compile and run the code to see it all working. So we can see initially that all three components have loaded. And if I click on the add user button a few times, you'll see that only the left component gets rendered. Now, if I click on one of the list items, the selected user state is going to get updated and this is going to cause the right component to be re-rendered. Now to achieve this, we created the selected user state in the app component and passed it down the component tree to each of the components that needed it. And so if we had a component with subcomponents and one of the components at the bottom of the component tree needed access to the selected user state, we would need to pass the state all the way down the component tree to the component that actually needed it. Now, if you find that too tedious, you can use global state where you can access that state from any component without having to pass the state from component to component. To do this, we need to use the use context provider hook, and this will allow us to create global state. So now we no longer need to pass the selected user state from component to component. To get the state, we need to use the use context hook. Now this function returns a generic type, so we'll have to specify the type to return. And we need to do this in every component that needs access to the global state. Now, before we go any further, I just want to mention that the use case for this hook is really intended for global application state. And so you would use it for things like storing a database connection or user session data. It's not really intended for this purpose. Now let's move on to the next Deoxys hook. Earlier in the code, I hard coded a default user. And this was to represent some initial data that could have come from an external source, such as a text file or a database. But when fetching data from an external source, it's possible that the component might actually render before the data has been returned. And this could cause weird rendering issues. So to fix this, we need to use the use effect hook. And this hook will re-render the component, but only if the state within the hook changes. Now we can test this by using a sleep function to mock the process of fetching some data from an external service. So here I'm using Tokyo sleep function to create a delay of three seconds. And after three seconds, the user will be added to the user state and the component will re-render itself. So you can see here that the left component has rendered, but it's rendered without the default user. But after three seconds, the user gets added to the list and the component is re-rendered. Now, knowing that the component gets re-rendered, this gives us an opportunity to show a loading message while we wait for the task to complete. And we can do this quite easily by using a Boolean state and setting its initial value to false. Then when the task completes, we can set that state to true. And in the left component, we can use an if statement to determine if that state is true or false. So if it's true, we can show the list of users. And if it's false, we can show a loading message. So now when we compile and run the app, this is what we should see. So we've now come to the end of this video. In the next video, we'll take a look at the use coroutine hook, which is used to spawn long running tasks, and we'll use it to develop a simple messaging app. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you all on the next video.